Hello, Jan. All right, can you hear me? I, I, you know, I can't get this. <laughs> oh, well, you can see half of me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Very good. I guess I, 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 Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So this is uh, Wally Ritchie, and uh, he's on his way back from uh, battling for his life. He has lots of dramatic stories to tell about the American healthcare system and uh, uh, recovering. Uh, I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, so I will let him talk about that some other time. Um, but he's got uh, a, a very good background in uh, missions and space and modeling this stuff way, way better than me. Uh, so I thought it would be a really good idea for, for all of us to talk together and see uh, what our next steps are. Uh, he's, w Wally is also aware of the document that we're working on for the presentation for for FCC and debris mitigation and all of that. So anyway, I will cede the floor to you all. I'll, uh, I'll take notes and I am recording the meeting and can edit it up. Um, before we start on um, fun stuff, did you want to go over anything to do with any of those other Documents they sent you for the FCC meeting it, for the for the narrative we were we were going to file with them before the meeting and all that. It made sense to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me see. I just want to enumerate the things I sent you. First of all, I sent you a uh, <clears throat> a site for um, Iridium's filing. Yes. And and you understand what I was doing there? They were. They were they were just sort of perpetuating the whole thing that they want to own a, they want to own a altitude slot, not just a frequency set of slots. Right. That was the first. I think this is the first time that we really see that sort of shell. It's it's the first place where it's documented for uh, you know God and all his children to see. I mean, it's it's it was really a very. Uh, popular uh, NPRM, so everybody saw what they were saying there. But they have, the, the, more, the more damning ones were actually those that were used in proceedings where they filed against some company. So, so they, were, they were commenting in, 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 a, in a reply comment cycle to somebody else's application. And there they would go after more, more specific saying they didn't want their uh, their orbit altitude crossed by this other satellite's, you know, this other satellite's uh, system, and therefore the license should not be granted. So they were tying the spectrum issue to the very specifically to the uh, debris issue, right. uh, and I wanted to get one that was more exact. But this one exactly says what we're claiming, so I, I think it's good, but it's just not doesn't quite show with, with a smoking gun, look, they're, they're saying a frequency item should be not allowed because of a debris matter. Right. So therefore mixing the two together. Right. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. That comes, okay. Comes so through that very was, clear. Yeah. All right. So, so then I sent you a, a, a PowerPoint, which had all the Delta V stuff. So if you're talking to, I mean, that was so you can use that for discussion with others about propulsion systems, but also I wanted to show that to the commission so they could see what the consequence would be for, for the small satellite service to use this class of, uh, of system that it, it, it was neither big or small. It's kind of like a medium sized rocket motor we got to do. And that's what, it, that's what it costs us every time to do one of these missions. Okay. And with the, uh, the bus technology that's around these days, you know, where almost every satellite has a three axis attitude control system. And I think we're going to have to have one too. It's not such a big deal at all just to uh, add Apogee point the rocket motor and do a, do a firing whenever we need to do it. But I mean, it's still, it's still something we wouldn't have to do, ha have had to do in the past. We weren't right. obliged to do in the past. Right. Yeah, this is. This and then is just... the third thing I say to you was a confirmation of the Delta V that we produced from phase three. And I, I wanted to get that before the commission so they could see look, these guys have done some pretty significant things. In fact, they hold the record 
for the largest Delta V maneuvers ever performed by a non-professional spacecraft. So we, we, can, we have the creds to do this. Yeah, these are excellent supporting documents. Yeah, and they also you sent the link budget for DVBS too. And the link budget's what I really wanted to spend the bulk of the time talking with you and Wally about, and I'm opening it here. All righty. Um, now, uh, what I wanted to do is review sort of the philosophy that I've been using. So let's let's kind of go through that, and and if and, and let me know where there's there's a departure in, in, in the approach or concept. So <clears throat> what Michelle and I have been working on is a presentation that we get to the commission. And I've done this in the past with AMSAT where we go in, we still know what we've been doing in the last 20 or 30 years. And to be honest, it's been sometime in 1990s, early 90s, which since we gave a really detailed presentation to the commission, about what the, what the amateur satellite service really is and what we've done. And when we did it the last time, we knocked their socks off. They had no idea we had done as much work as we've done and created the technology that we created. So I think they were very appreciative, and I'm hoping we'll kind of do something like that here. So, you know, the biggest problem we have in the service right now, in addition to people trying to filter our spectrum, which is always a problem, is is this new thing about debris. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that. And so what I was trying to do is come up with a way where we could have our cake and eat it too. And it would be if we can have the performance of a high altitude orbit without having the, the, the grief and everything we have to go through if we had our own, say, geo spacecraft where we'd have to manage the geospacecraft the same way as the big guys do. Uh, and if we, if we now can't even use medium altitude LEOs, like say the old microsats, where we had four satellites at 800 kilometers altitude, that wouldn't fly anymore because we, we couldn't bring those uh, down in a few years time when we were through with them and the commission would start um, not approving us launching those things. And, and, and to be honest, a, a LEO satellite at about 500 to 525 kilometers, we've just proven at the company I work at will make CubeSats, that if you get a, a six year CubeSat that's in an orbit higher than about 525, it won't come down in uh, for about six years. And six years is sort of the magic number that the commission is now using instead of the old older 25 year rule so they were saying that you had to bring your junk down in 25 years well the new thinking of the agencies of our lovely government is that we're going to have to do this more like in five or six years and you can't go much higher than 525 550 kilometers and be assured of coming down therefore What's going to happen is they they will not be happy at all about granting us a license to go up any higher than that. And I don't think the cons capability of such a spacecraft for, for the amateur guy uh, for, for, for AMS is going to be good enough. Now, first of all, do you guys more or less buy into the, this argument so far? Um, yes. Yeah, so far, except for the you know, this concept of direct to disposal orbit in GEO, that eliminates, I think, a lot of the issues because you're essentially launching yourself into, uh, as, as a CubeSat being ejected from a, an upper stage canister. Even if you have total failure right out of the gate, you're in disposal orbit. Yeah, I think we can do we can talk both and and not not either or. So yeah, um, we, we yeah. Might... The whole idea was to do do an and here. So I'm not saying we'd never use a geo orbit, and I'm not saying we'd never use a a Leo orbit. We'd we'd want to continue doing that, but we 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 have to comply with the constraints uh, that the commission is putting on all other services, including ours, to do that. So we'd have to live with that. And is that okay with us? And I think 
you know what I was suggesting we say to the commission is, yeah, we'll, we'll do those and we'll comply with your rules. But that does mean, I think, that we're probably going to be limited to something like 550 kilometers uh, for a circular orbit for LEO. Um, well, we'd have to see what the Delta V's re requirements are, but they're far less than, um, I think they're far less than, than our, would first be thought. Um, th the station keeping could be minimal. Yeah, in fact, we could use it because of our frequency band, we can probably use a drifter orbit so we don't have to do the geo trick where you have to stay within a 0 0.05 degree box. Uh, exactly. You know, on orbit. So the thing is, so, yeah, that, that, there's going to be a lot of missions that are going, going to go away from the con from an onboard Apache kick motor to a space to SpaceX or somebody's upper stage that's taking the payloads directly to geo or directly to a maneuvering orbit near geo yeah so so the, the, uh, yeah and I think we addressed that in the paper Michelle where we talk about the fact that one way we could use a geo is, is go as a hosted payload, just about like Oscar 99, 100, Oscar 100. Well, well, it's not really, it's not really hosted. It's really a secondary payload to the- I, I get it. So you, jet, you jettison the spacecraft once you get to geo orbit, but then, then you would have to have enough delta V and it's probably a few hundred meters per second. About the same as what we're talking about for these others, you could you could go into a geo and then you could modify the geo to be a higher geo and call that your graveyard orbit. That 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 will work. And the other possibility but, is, is although they use only the higher, a, a lower a lower than geo is also a possibility. Do they allow that? I wasn't aware of that. I'm not sure. I'd only heard of the graveyard orbits always being like uh, a few thousand kilometers above the 35786. Yeah, there's a zone uh, 150 to 250, I think, above. But I believe, well, te technically, if it's below, that's also a, a, a possibility. You know, the, the, the mitigation requirements for off off away from geo from in disposal you know you're talking about millions of miles of separation you know so it's not a, it's not anywhere near the density that anything in in leo or sure of course of course no i i it's just a, a matter of what the, the commission is going to buy and i think they would buy the whole idea of having it in, in a higher orbit. I, and if they have a lower orbit for disposal, that's fine too. Um, yeah, and, that's, that's and, the sort of, this is the sort of question that, that can more easily be uh, explored uh, in this process of, of making a presentation and getting them to know us and starting to, to introduce the yeah. fact that we have all of these the capacity for experimentation and trying new things. So it, it may be that they go, what? No, you know, yeah. not a chance. Well, okay. And then we go, hey, think about it a little bit more and, and you know, just let it sit for a while. And then, you know, we may end up being able to, you know, uh, socialize this idea, um, you know, but I, I fully expect a lot of it, a lot of it to, to have so eyebrows will be raised, questions will be asked. We need to be prepared to be innovative, but also back it back it up uh, with the data. And I think we're doing a really good job there. We're well, well on the way. The, and, there, and there is one other thing about this, Michelle, where we'll get some feedback. When we give this presentation and we, if we put like a white paper, that white paper in first uh, that we've been drafting and, and then mark that ex parte, or ex parte, sorry. Uh, and, and, and then we give the presentation and then we submit a notice that we gave this ex parte. Then, all of that community who's participated in that um, 
comet cycle on the uh, you know uh, uh, orbit debris in the modern age thing. They'll all get a copy of this, and then we'll see who who pushes back. Yes. But what I what I would say is you you now have today today given the environment of the communications services being provided by satellite today in the modern era you're going to have two communities who are going to push back at you one is the leo community doing the ngso fss stuff so let's call it one web and friends or you might call it spacex and friends but it's that community of people they'll push back uh if you show that your orbit even goes through their altitude right they'll push back as iridium has done in the past the second group is the is the long knives sharp group which is the geo group those are the, those are the kings of the hill those are the guys who make all the money and have all the attention of the commission and every other in the itu and they probably will will have something to say about us occupying a geo position at all right and modifying that position to go up or down you can pretty well expect that they'll have um something to say about it uh, i'm just guessing at this now this is my my educated guess whereas if we do some of the uh, in between cases that you know they've got a lot to they got a lot to answer for. They're already taking the the cream off the top. They're always they're got getting the best orbits or calm. They can hardly complain if we try and find a solution for ourselves where we're transitioning from one one thing to another. And if we co come up with an inventive strategy where we don't affect the Leos and we don't affect the Geos at all, well. <laughs> You know what can they say? So that's 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 sort of the strategy I'm 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 uh, thinking of here. Yeah, that sounds sounds right on, and we we also have potential allies, in uh, people like Noah, who you know have the hardest time putting up these giant geos. And yeah, it, 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 funny enough, all the government agencies will be our allies here because they want to use space too. And the greedy and the greedy uh, operators, com operators, all of them, GTO and NG, uh, GSO and NGSO are all taking the prime space, and then they're bitching about other people using space. Well, that just doesn't fly, and we've got to make sure. I mean, we could be the we may be the fly in the ointment, but we can be a pretty nasty fly, and. Making this point that everybody's got the right to space, even us little guys. Yes, and, and whether it's whether it's uh, plus two fifty or minus two fifty, uh, a drifting orbit, which could even be at zero or or inclined, also gives you a um, constellation. So that constellation of say six of those compared to the cost of a big geo and geostationary with 10 year lifetime and end of life and maneuver and disposal orbit. Instead of going right to the disposal orbit, a drifting disposal orbit that is nevertheless trackable and predictable. Um, if you make it a constellation, a small constellation, You'll always have one or two in view. Yeah, you you probably only need three to six in that kind of configuration to even have double coverage. You're right, exactly. Yeah, but the issue is you, you don't want to have you don't want to have the only two choices are on the horizon. So sure, somewhere between three and six is uh, probably ideal. But those yeah. also they also end up servicing the whole globe. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and by the way, you can do you can do the same thing with three to six uh, GTOs as well because they're hanging out there near Apogee most of the time. So if you were to antiphase two satellites in one orbit plane, in one orbit, so you got one when one is at perigee, the other is at Apogee, then you're going to have double coverage with those in in the region of the world that it serves all the time. 
And with three of those, you, uh, three, three orbit planes, you're going to have, with two satellites in each plane, you're going to have essentially just as effect, almost as effective coverage as you would with a geo, uh, a, a geo drifter. But, but, you know, even both of those orbits are cool and it stays out of harm's way. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't mind adding that one to the list. Um, but I do think if you're fooling around with propulsion systems and you're at the geo arc, there's just going to be a, uh, a reaction from the there'll geo crowd. Yeah, there'll be too much pushback. You want to have- It may not be too much, but, but you will get some. And I think we can argue the case, but you know, I mean, you know, the big guys are going to say hams. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They have no idea that we've performed more complex propulsion maneuvers than they ever thought about doing. But they don't know that for a fact, and they and they can't and we can't show the uniformity and consistency that they have. We don't have billions of dollars, so you know, it's just I would say. Go for it, it uh, Michelle. Go for it and put both of those orbits in as a candidate. In fact, I like the idea of putting that in and using our page space to do that rather than discussing the unmodified GTO, the one I'm having trouble making uh, re enter. Yeah. Uh, it may be better to just bring that up at a future date and put this one in because it's a more interesting case. I would agree because I, I just don't see GTO being, uh, I mean, a, uh, a, a geostationary being viable for-, for oh, a, 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 total, a, a total GTO. Well, yeah, uh, you could do a little GTO. It would have about the same kind of performance as, as this, sorry, a, 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 now I'm, now I'm confused. Did you say a, a, a GTO? No, or I meant a, geo? A, a true geo. Geo. Yeah, is going to so, counter so much resistance from the commercial interest that, that are in the same plane. It's going to. Uh, I, I don't see that getting through. You, you you could be clever if you have if you have delta v to start with, and I think for a geo you're going to have to have some delta v. By the way, there's another way to do it, which is the hosted payload idea, like like uh, like uh, MSAT DL did on on Oscar at hundred. That that yeah. mode always ex exists if you can talk somebody into paying for it. Right. And taking the risk of the, you got other risks there that they have to take on. Right. So I mean, well, yeah, but those are more like having kill switches and stuff like that to make sure you can be truly off that kind of thing. Yeah, that that's pretty straightforward stuff in this day and age, I think. Well, those have but, always been there, and th those opportunities will remain. Yeah, we should take advantage of them when we can. You know that it's it can be added to this mix. Well, I've I've already put in the the case of a geo hosted payload right. what i don't have in there is a geo uh uh, uh, uh as a secondary payload yeah free I, I, secondary I, payload yeah i i i often think about that but but to me it, 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 it it's hard for me to erase all the phase three stuff yeah. or phase three and phase four stuff from my mind where we were always talking about bigger spacecraft but a 6U at GEO would perform the same as a 6U GTO at Apogee. Right. So it's the Apogee case, and we're going to talk about that one here, I think. Okay, yeah. And, you know, I think we might get away with a 12U or a 6U, probably 12U. Well, if we can afford it, it's fine. Uh, I, I, As you'll see here, I'm making, I'm trying to make the links close with it, with a 6U's worth of power, but that 6U has deployable panels. Right. Um, I think, Michelle, you've seen my sort of model case that I did back in 2014, 2015 for AMSAD. Yes. The way that the panels flip out and everything, it would it would be a design something like that. Yeah. So it's producing 40, 50 watt kind of mean power levels for the for the spacecraft. So the payload gets about two thirds of that power, three quarters of that power. Yeah, and the twelve the twelve U gets us up to 
to more like a hundred watt level. Yeah, it could it could be as good as that. And you can see you'll see in these links how that factors in there. But you probably know that already. You guys already know. Uh, well, uh, so let's now talk about the comms. And the comms is relative to uh, a GTO orbit, as you see here. But if we take the case where the spacecraft is at the apogee of this orbit, it's the performance of a geo is going to be the same. So we can we can actually talk to that as we go through this. Right. Now, there are, there are two things I thought about back in the 2014-15 era as I was trying to help AMSAT help itself, and I wasn't successful. <laughs> um, but uh, I... I was thinking about transponders using these kind of orbits, and I was thinking, well, it would be really cool um, if we could use some gain antennas and get ourselves into the millimeter wave region of our of our spectrum, so we can actually get some real performance um, and use that during the apogee portion. But then go to some of the older traditional modes that 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 that. that Amateurs like a lot, like to, uh, like uh, VHF, UHF, or or uh, you know 12, 12, 1260 up, uh, four thirty five down, or you know some of the lower frequency bands that where people would be using sideband and CW more, but use those near the perigee of the orbit where we're using lower frequency, so we're using non-directive, um, more omnidirectional antennas. So if we could, it had a enough volume, like maybe a 12 u would, would do it, we could put in a second transponder, which you'd call the perigee transponder, and it would, it would you know, be operating into antennas not longer than a 70 centimeter monopole or dipole, take your pick. Um, I don't know if we'd, been to going down to two meters anymore because that's a pretty big, pretty pretty long antenna, but it could be done. Um, but anyway, so the idea of having a perigee transponder and an apogee transponder. So that that idea sort of lingers in my mind. It's just something for you guys to think about. Um, yeah, for, for the geo case, um, you're, we're pretty much count. limited. If you want to have a full beam, you're you're going to have a 17 degree beam width. Yeah, no, I, I'm really talking here to a GTO. If, if, yeah. if, if, if the, the whole thing is not very many people could use the perigee transponder probably because, okay, the, the perigee might be 1,250 kilometers, That's but true. it's going to go by really fast, and there's only a few of them a day, a couple a day. So, you know, it's not going to get a lot of use, but when it does get used, it, it will be cool and fun for people. So that was the thought there. Or haven't Go thought ahead. about it in a while because I, I did get a copy of your of the slides that you used in uh, 20, 2014. And now that you've explained it, um, now it makes more sense, like how how this would be operated. So thanks for yeah. thanks for going over that. It it really helped clear up uh, what this yeah, is all about. The idea is rather than wasting that time, because to be honest, yeah, you could target track the um, the. the the, the, the nature of this spacecraft, and it would be true for a geo as well, is you're, you're pointing the spacecraft main antennas, the big antennas, the high gain antennas, at the center of the Earth. And then you got to deal with the beam, beam roll off that that re results in. So that the beam roll off and everything goes on near the perigee of the orbit is going to be gross. And, and more, more importantly, you, you've got to also, you're going to get up to like, uh, I'm going to say five to ten degrees of motion of the of the pointing vector at the spacecraft per minute near perigee of the orbit. So the attitude control system has got to work a little harder. And anyway, the whole thing is that, that this, such a, such a millimeter wave transponder is is is, is a comm system as opposed to a data delivery system. That would be another thing. We're just delivering data to one point on the ground, but we're not. We're trying to talk to as many radio amateurs as we can as this thing flies over. So, so it's, 
it doesn't work very well in the millimeter wave at perigee. So rather than throw that part of the orbit away, which we of course could do, the idea was, well, let's add a little simpler old style bed pipe linear transponder to do that. And everybody can play single side band again. Yeah, that, that makes uh, that makes sense in the in the context of constellations. Yeah, I think. Yeah, and it would be for constellations. So fundamentally, I, I'd say that's a nice to have. It's, it's it's just a concept that if you have an operational system, and I think that's what I am working toward is I'd like us to keep our spectrum by making sure we're an operational service and. Somebody like the FCC or you know any other administration in the world uh, can look say oh yeah that's our amateur community and they have this, this great little system they use and and they're making good use of their spectrum that that's the kind of thing I'd like to do so it means we need kind of an operational service and of course there's all the other stuff Michelle that goes with that like fundraising and donations and gifting and all that that would be you know, yeah. consistent with not not for profit organizations. Correct. What what we're what we're selling down the river a little bit that AMSAT was always really good at during my uh, during my watch was we were always generating new technology and we there was nobody who was developing more technology for space than we were and I honestly literally think now thinking back on it. We really kickstarted the small side world by the technology work we did during those phase. Uh, thanks mostly to uh, Carl Meinzer, and I would say give Martin Sweeting a lot of credit there too, and others. But 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 we that that part would be a little bit backpedaled to getting an operational service. Or we it would always be nice as we go forward to have something new on every spacecraft if we could. Well, with reconfigurable spacecraft, with the rise of FPGAs actually being able to go in space, then that is something we can do. Oh, um, we, it's, it's it, that's the thing is it's not a matter of can doing it. It's a matter of comparing the value of that to the value of maintaining something steadfast so that we can grow right. the size of the, the community. Right. We need to grow the size of the amateur community altogether. And if if a spacecraft that made it possible to do global communications digitally and, and provide a fun path as an alternative to the, don't forget, we're fighting the internet here. Yes. For our spectrum. Yes. You could, you could, instant you could, communication you could make the sorts on your cell phone. And yeah, it's uh, we got a, a lot of competition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and getting more with the, uh, the one webs and spacex of the world trying to grab everything they can and 5g cellular as you'll be aware okay so um we you know back in 2014 and 15 phil karn and i were beating this whole thing to death regarding digital transponders and stuff i was working at work on uh millimeter wave stuff and having a, a lot of fun and enthusiastic uh experiences with millimeter wave and um phil karn has always been pushing that direction and, and obviously digitally so um after a lot of thought we came up with these two frequency bands uh, tom clark was throwing his oar in the water and he was pushing he said you know that 24 gigahertz the 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 rain the rain is going to kill you there the and, and the excess path loss is going to be awful you'll find I think that you're better off at 10, 10.5 and just forget about anything higher than that. And um, he and I both disagreed and agreed on that point. And um, I, when I did this link budget, which is, uh, it, it's hard to talk about this in one, in one swoop. This is sort of like an evolution of 15 or 20 years of work here but it's uh, it's both commercial i it started as an amateur link uh spreadsheet then it became work then it became amateur again it's it's gone back and forth about five times so this is actually the best one i've ever developed and it's i took the most advanced work one and i added 
some beans technology to it so that now the amateur one is the best one I've ever done. So uh, this one, um, I, I did trade the other way, which is try uh, X band up and uh, KA band down. And I found, I, I've got that one and I could even show it to you today, but uh, suffice it to say that the, the trades in terms of what the user had to do to use the system, uh, it, this, it favors this one. This is the better choice for, for trying to do this. And it, it's always something you have to think of is what R&D does the user have to use to get on this thing? Are you going to use the, do the R&D for that, that group of users? Or, you know, are you going to make kits? How are, you, how are you going to approach the user community using this box in the sky? Right. And uh, do, you make, do you make it harder to, to transmit and easier to listen or the other way around? And the, the path had always been before, make it easy to transmit and make it a little harder to listen. But I think this is the other way around. Yeah, that's, I uh, agree with what you've just said. And we could go the other way. We could we, go the yeah, other we, way here. We definitely could. And, the, the reason, which you probably share, is that uh, the way that our license and the way our service is set up is that everybody should be able to receive. So you don't get people that want to transmit um, without people hearing it. And that if you make it easy to receive, the R&D is and out you there. Should grow, you should grow the audience faster and get... And, and yeah. you, you know, you'll always have more listeners than you will transmitters. So that, that that's a good thing too. So the, the, there, there'll be uh, SW, what do you call it? SWLs in this, in this right. crowd as well. Just yes. want to listen to what's going on. Yeah. And it's easier to point a dish to receive, you know, which is why we put so much effort into the dual band feeds to be able to give people one antenna to point and track and, being able to set up to to receive, to be able to point, to peak up on signal, um, kind of leads directly to you better make it easy for people to to track and to point, especially at the microwave frequencies that we're talking about. So all of it kind of fall, it all falls out of of a variety of assumptions about the service, about operations, about building the community, because we really have to build it up from almost scratch at this point. The right now, uh, amateur satellite means going out with an aero antenna and doing a leo pass and there's no time to develop a community you have barely time to trade call signs and people don't even have time to write it down they just record it every there's lots and lots of schedules that are set up in advance you know lots of grid chasing and that's what it means right now to here in north america in now in europe it's different with qo 100 and you can see the difference and the difference is growing every week i tune into the qo 100 net on BATC and I listen to the round table of everybody so excited about tweaking their station or experimenting with their equipment or learning new operating styles or discovering something cool about the transponder. And I can see evidence all over Twitter and Reddit and you know talking to people all the time about what a true revolutionary thing QO100 has been. It is building a community and it is building skills. Every week that goes by, that we don't have something like that. Uh, it feels like we are falling more and more behind. And part of that is an illusion. You know, we will get there, we can do it, you know, and uh, even though it's far away and we can't see it, we can still benefit from all the development and, and, and what have you. Um, but we are going to have to build that sort of same sort of community from zero here. And that's well, but, part but of the task. We but that that transponder won't last forever and there's only one of them and it's not easily replaceable so that community can be our community too at some point in time so there's yes. a crossover yes you absolutely. could imagine there i would absolutely but, like but that to happen and 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 what you're saying is absolutely borne out by 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 that in that uh we have to be ready to fill that slot when Things start. We don't know what the demise of that thing could be. If if an SSPA fails, they could be off the air tomorrow instantaneously if they haven't got redundancy. They probably have some. What what I've tried to do is make it very clear that we want to work with them and we want it to be open source. And that way, it's not you know 
It's just yet another proprietary system, sort of, you know, but am amateur system or, you know, you, so you have to kind of be uh, careful and, and respectful and keep approaching organizations that are doing work like this to try to collaborate together whenever possible, uh, to share work, uh, to show that we're uh, pulling our weight and, and all of that, that we're not a threat, that we don't view them as some sort of weird competition. Uh, but we do have to be aware of their, um, you know, uh, assumptions, the way that they have worked for, for forever. Uh, coming around to being truly open is uh, especially the way that things kind of changed between uh, DL and NA, um, you know, since since the sure. collaborative projects, uh, you know, ITAR really destroyed it. So to pop up and say, look, we fixed the problem. Here's the regulatory results. You know, we, we have a ways to go to develop a really good uh, collaborative sort of deal with AMSAT deal. And that might not ever happen and that's fine. You know, they serve their community yeah. and have their projects and their opportunities and we have ours. We should just keep working on this uh, improving relationship uh, whenever we, we possibly can, you know. Yeah, no, the, these spacecraft uh, routinely, the big geos are purchased with a 15 year warranty. So uh, if they've handled the way they built that payload, the way they build usual uh, geo uh, transponders, then they'll have made the whole system redundant in bits and pieces. And since this was done by a com uh, commercial company for AMSAT DL, yep. Okay, so so there's a uh, there's a lot of things going on to to say there. First of all, that probably means that the, the system is redundant, and probably elements of the transponder are redundant, like LNAs and SSPAs are redundant in there. So th that really increases the probability that you will get a very long lifetime out of it. Second comment is it 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 becomes an us versus them partly because of the satellite geostationary position that you can't do anything about that's a problem with one geo spacecraft it can never be a global community system and okay yes you can you can make connections via the internet in places where it doesn't have coverage but that's not quite the same i don't think as having your own station right um so so there's that and then and then there's all the amsat past politics where AMSAT DL is still trying to be a viable organization. We know that AMSAT NA is, is, doesn't want to talk about technology anymore. They want to do their own thing and they have their own agenda, which means that we're going to have the unusual circumstance where there could be two or more viable amateur satellite uh, organizations in the United States, the United States, not a third world country, but the United States having more than one organization that will confuse the hell out of the world to some extent and it, i don't think it's a slam dunk and or i can just plug in and say oh we're the new amsat i don't no, think it's going to work no, that way no and that is not our goal our vision or any part of of our uh, but but it may be the vision that other americans probably would put in their mind is what they what they think they see yes so you get it's part of the message you got to get across is no we're not the new amsat we're something else yes but you have to define carefully what that is because all the other old amsat organizations and around the world like uh what's another one uh amsat argentina okay they need to understand who they're interfacing with and you know it's 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 going to seem weird to them that, that they're not working with AMSAT NA anymore because AMSAT NA is an AMSAT NA. It's just AMSAT, right? They dropped the NA. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole story. But I I still use AMSAT NA because it's to me um, a very sort of um, I guess elitist or entitled to then claim that you are the 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 AMSAT and you know just because you were first. Uh, you know, since it is very geographically limited, especially after ITAR, then you may as well go ahead and say you're AMSAT NA, and then it puts you in, and it, may, it looks looks better when you have, you know, a dozen or so other organizations around the world that are using AMSAT dash, and then the country or regional name. Yep. It just, well, it used to be you know, 25 of them. Yeah, you it's, know. it's just a, to me, it's like, it's, it's more um, friendly 
and collaborative. Uh, so that's why, and I, I was told to, to use AMSAT-NA a long time ago. So some there's some recent guidance that that's been dropped, but uh, you know, I don't know. And we already have run into this trouble. We are a research institute. We're set up to do R&D. We are not a membership organization. We chose specifically not to be that in order not to compete with AMSAT. We're here to help all AMSAT organizations and anyone else that wants cool R&D stuff to happen you know, for, for amateur space and terrestrial. And this, you can repeat this message over and over again, but if people choose to view you as uh, existential threat or competition, then all you can do is keep repeating your message and not act like it, you know, keep showing up and keep uh, behaving in a, a different way. Uh, you know, and with an international team, um, it's really difficult to try to peg us as some sort of placement for AMSAT. We have absolutely no intention of, of trying to do that in, in any way. Yep. And we just refuse to feud. It's just, that's the only real, that's the only really strategy that we have is to just keep repeating the message, keep showing up and providing good work for free. And uh, you know, committed to the technology, advancing the state of the art, doing fun, innovative things, and not uh, doing anything that would look like replacing or competing with uh, any of the AMSAT organizations. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, with that, we can start into this a little bit. 